So I started the recording. The streaming is also live. Okay. And I'll start to share the stream on the other pages. Just a kind request before before we start, if you can, if I could kindly ask you to um, send me some pictures while I'm speaking, okay? In order to uh, use them in my posts. Oh, sure. Yeah, I feel good. Um, I, I can do that, yeah. it's okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Good. When we start? We are live, we can go ahead. Okay, so good afternoon Atlanticron, it was better to say Buenos Sera Atlanticron as usually for 30 years, but uh, today it's a day of Atlanticron, another day of Atlanticron, only unfortunately one day since uh, August 2022, we don't know what's happening in August 2021, but for now I'm uh, very honored and I'm very happy to have a chance to introduce one of our special guests for Atlantic Run Day. It's a pleasure to, uh, to have uh, here with us at Atlantic Run Day, Mrs. Simona Mirela Miculescu, which is senior Romanian diplomat, is the actual ambassador of Romania delegate for UNESCO. Uh, prior for this position, she was the representative of United Nations Secretary General and head of the national office in Belgrade. And before that, um, she um, served Romania as a, uh, ambassador of the permanent representative of Romania in the United Nations in, in, uh, in Europe. Mrs. Simona Miculescu also served as a foreign policy advisor for the Romanian president and is the first woman in uh, Romanian's diplomatic history to be graded to rank the ambassador. More than that, I invite you to just to search on uh, Google just to see how many titles Mrs. Miculescu has, but not only titles about his activities. I, um, again, I'm honored and uh, I'm, well, I prefer to make it shorter, this presentation, Mrs. Miculescu, because it's important what we want to say to us today. So welcome to Atlantic Run. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sorin. Well, uh, I hear you. I have to say that we've been talking about this, uh, doing something together for almost 30 years. Uh, 30 years being also my, the number of years in my, uh, in my diplomatic career. So we've been patient, but for the kids who are listening, it's important to realize that whenever you want something, you end up by doing it. So I'm truly pleased to finally join you um, uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, um, online meetings have their advantages. This is one of them. And it's great to join you from Paris. Bonjour de Paris um, to everybody. Um, uh, you wanted me to talk about a topic that is very, very dear to my heart. And it's kind of easy and pleasant to do it. And thank you for this opportunity, because I truly believe that uh, your your, your audience um, uh, should know a lot about cultural diplomacy as whatever we do these days is a sort of cultural diplomacy. So what I can tell you from the start is that I am a firm believer in the role of cultural diplomacy uh, in, in peace building and conflict resolutions. Uh, this is actually something very close to my heart, but also to my profession. And... Um, I truly think cultural diplomacy is an absolutely crucial platform uh, to build, let's say, bridges over troubled waters. Um, before telling you a few things about my opinion on cultural diplomacy in conflict resolution, um, let me remind everybody the general definition of diplomacy and you will see why. So, you know that diplomacy in international relations is defined as an instrument uh, by which government officials conduct negotiations and other relations between nations. And diplomacy can take place through various means, including political negotiations, cultural events, trade, and beyond. The primary actors in diplomacy are the governments. Okay? Now, they are actually trying to, to, to shape international policy 
from the direction of their home government, right? But cultural diplomacy is the exchange of ideas, of information, of art, of business uh, among nations and their peoples, right? In order to enhance and, I don't know, improve mutual understanding. And anyone can take part in this form of diplomacy. And it does not require involvement by a state government, even if I don't say that that is not uh, important. Some may compare uh, diplomacy and cultural diplomacy as hard versus soft power. But I like the view according to which it is hard versus smart power. Cultural diplomacy is smart, smart power because it requires creativity uh, to innovate new solutions. It also offers flexibility, unlike the sometimes rigid uh, diplomatic frames assigned by governments in conventional diplomacy. And this flexibility better accommodates diversity and multiculturalism. Um, in an increasingly globalized, uh, interdependent world, in which the proliferation of information technology ensures we all have greater access to each other than ever before and uh, creates new platforms for the freedom of expression, cultural diplomacy is, I think, critical to fostering peace uh, throughout the world. When learned and applied at all levels, uh, it possesses the unique ability to influence the global public opinion and the ideology of individuals, of communities, of cultures, nations, which can accelerate the realization of the crucial principles such as respect and recognition of cultural diversity and heritage, uh, global intercultural dialogue, uh, justice, uh, equality, interdependence, uh, protection of international human rights, global peace and stability. All these are at the foundation of our humankind. And culture is a universal concept. I would not imagine any uh, peace building or conflict resolution uh, exercise without using at least an element of culture. And of course, if we manage to place this within the diplomatic effort as a complement to the diplomatic, to the traditional diplomatic efforts, then I think we have a bigger chance to succeed. When culture is used uh, as a tool of negotiation between countries and peoples, then it is useful and it contributes to the development of all of us. Now, I think that for more than a century, um, the cultural diplomacy has been an integral part of the contemporary diplomatic practices, right? It's, it's smart power, as I like to call it, allows to create lasting relationships of uh, trust, of uh, affection, friendship and partnership in a wider uh, political and social context. Culture, uh, cultural policies, cultural diplomacy of the 21st century acquire the status of a strategic political tool, both in internal political aspects and within the frames of foreign policies. And culture is a component, a fundamental component, I could say, of building relations of trust and approximation, but also it can be a ground for misunderstandings and conflicts that may occur between different cultures and religions. And we've seen examples of this. The cultural diplomacy really can be used for, a useful instrument for, for prevention, not only for conflict resolution, but for the prevention of conflicts and crises especially where the political and economic uh, conflicts are followed by religious and cultural confrontations. Its role in the rehabilitation and the return to normal life in any society, in the, especially in the regions where wars uh, and armed conflicts uh, are, is 
indisputable. For certain regions, um, unfortunately, the absence of peace has become their most uh, deficient factor for decades. And if the cultural diplomacy has the power to prevent and rehabilitate um, the serious disturbances of peace and peaceful international coexistence of peoples, states or religions, it certainly can be one of the most important components and instruments in building a lasting and sustainable peace um, on the current international scene. Um, the global peace, the minimization of the numerous open regional war hotspots, the whole world um, uh, 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 of economic and social development in, 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 in conditions of necessary consensus of the opposed interests must in itself contain components of culture and cultural diplomacy. As you know, we all love culture because, I don't know, the culture informs, uh, creates, uh, connects, converges, and can be an irreplaceable tool in the processes of social cohesion. Numerous educational forms, uh, music, fine arts, literary contents, TV uh, and radio, uh, films, uh, the theaters and ballet, uh, archaeology, cultural heritage, language as an indispensable instrument for understanding, up to the newest forms of digital cultural action through the largest global medium, the internet, are inevitable and vitally important factors for solutions of post-conflict and post-crisis situations, but also for prevention. So, dear younger friends, I would like you to remain with uh, at least one of thoughts from our virtual encounter. And I would tell you that one of the most important ideas and principles actually uh, that derive from the constitution of UNESCO, the organization where I have the, the honor of representing Romania, uh, and this acronym stands, as you know, for United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, is the following. I quote, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is, it is in the minds of men that the defense of peace must be constructed. So help us and help yourselves and help the humanity while building peace and peaceful minds every day of your life. Because as Winston Churchill, I think the most quoted prime minister of all times and from all the countries, as he used to say, the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. So thank you. I'm, I wanted to express you some general thoughts before we engage in a dialogue because this is what I love the most, engaging in a dialogue with brilliant young people. And I know that Atlanticon has been gathering for so many years brilliant young minds. I cannot wait to have a dialogue with you. Thank you very much for, let's say, um, uh, a starting point. And I agree, it's good to have some dialogue. Before to start this dialogue, let me to just uh, remind it to our uh, uh, participants and, of course, uh, to uh, underline um, I want to thank you to Heather Anderson, which is the president of World Genesis Foundation, which, uh, which is UNESCO club. I want to tell you that um, uh, this organization was set up in, 19, in, in 2000, and uh, that was set up after Mr. Anderson uh, was visiting Romania and uh, enjoyed so much Atlantic Run. Atlantic Run was under umbrella of UNESCO Romania for years. And uh, he took this idea and go back to the United States. And he said, now I want to do how much I can for the young people having UNESCO 
uh, in my mind, science, culture, arts, and sports. So, um, Heather, I think it's, uh, it's time for dialogue, as uh, Mrs. Ambassador uh, pointed. So, first question. Yeah, sure, I'll start. I'll start the ball rolling here with, with some questions. And first, thank you so much for joining us today. It's just wonderful to have you in our uh, first of hopefully many, uh, many Atlanticron days. Um, and my question to you is what got you started in, in all of this? To all our young people listening on our social media platforms, uh, whether they're live with us here or watching us on Facebook, really as you know what got you started and, and how are you able to drive your career and, and passion uh, so what got me started in my diplomatic career you mean yeah like mm -hmm. like you woke up one day and said i want to change the world i want to make a difference and and how did you, how did you begin that because i think there's a lot of young people especially today um that i hear from that want to make a difference pay it forward be involved and it's it's overwhelming sometimes it's like where do you where do you start and and what was the moment where you decided i'm gonna do you know exactly what you're doing now well, um, one of my um, uh, high school, no, the secondary school, my, my secondary school um, uh, classmates reminded me the other day that in the fifth grade, when our, uh, uh, professor, our teacher um, uh, asked us um, what we want to be when we grow up, mm -hmm. apparently I said ambassador. Really? Yes. Wow, so even at a young but, age in high school. But I don't remember that <laughs> because all my life I wanted to be an actress and mm -hmm. singer. The story why I didn't become that is very long and complicated. Mm -hmm. but I would say that destiny wanted me to become an actress on the world stage. Uh, to, uh, now, being, uh, being uh, uh, totally honest, I had this beautiful dream on the back of my mind since the early years. But before the Romanian Revolution in 1989, women couldn't be diplomats in the communist Romania. So that was an impossible dream. So after the revolution took place in 1989, uh, I uh, gathered in a couple of years some courage to compete in a contest in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time Adriana Stase, for the Romanians who are attending this, um, took the decision to bring as many newcomers in the ministry as possible. Uh, and there were some contests and about 200 new uh, people uh, became diplomats. So this is how it started. I, uh, I got accepted. And uh, <laughs> since then, it's been a roller coaster because I have to tell your young audience that whenever you embark in such a career, um, it's, it's a lot about, maybe like in any career, it's about huge, huge work, um, uh, 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 permanent intellectual curiosity, um, uh, uh, not only a wish, but a necessity of personal development for the rest of your life. A diplomat is a lifelong learner because diplomacy is the profession of new beginnings. Look, uh, I, I come to Paris, I build here, uh, uh, you know, something uh, related to a, a stronger profile of Romania and UNESCO, and then I'm out. I'm going for another new beginning in another country. Well, for me, it's retirement, but anyway, that's <laughs> a, another story. Um, so um, it is a profession that involves not only hard work, but a lot of personal sacrifices. And it's, uh, it's me, uh, a wife and mother of two children who is living now alone in Paris, who is telling you that. So mm. uh, being a diplomat is not only that fancy and uh, trivial perception that most of the people have that you know, oh, what are diplomats doing? Just going to receptions, eating and drinking champagne. No, no, that is much more than that. I, 
many times associated uh, the profession of diplomat with that of a miner because we are actually digging for gold you know in depth in the underground right it's an invisible work a lot of times our negotiations our lobbying is in the underground is not visible and discretion and confidentiality still is one of the major assets and imperatives of this profession despite it's the, the, the dimension of public or cultural dimension uh, diplomacy mm -hmm. right so right. in order you know you, you work in the under, underground in order to bring the gold to the public to the light of the day right so mm -hmm. um it's been a roller coaster but i adored and appreciated every second with the exception of course of the moments when i had to miss a lot of important moments in my personal life moments and especially people in my personal life so mm -hmm. um i have to say that uh, you know even the french writers of the 17th century used to say that uh, all the great victories bear the mark of great sacrifices it is so true even now in the 21st century so wow. don't expect that a career like mine which is, yes, it looks uh, prestigious, prodigious. It, it came also with a price, okay? So the important is to all the time trying to make a balance and to make peace with, uh, you know, advantages and disadvantages and, you know, try to juggle, you know, personal life and professional life as much as you can in order to, to get that balance that everybody talks about. But what I can say is that it's one of the most beautiful and noble professions because, and that is why actually I came back from the UN system where I worked five years uh, until recently, because I never experienced a, a greater joy and pride than when I represented my country. So mm -hmm. for me, representing Romania, has been the, 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 you know, the perpetuum mobile of, of, of my career. And I just love so deeply my country. And I, it, it is always, whenever I, I, you know, in the UN General Assembly, for instance, when I, I was raising the, 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 the name tag of my country, requesting for the floor on behalf of my country, on behalf of my nation. Wow. It gives me chills even now. <laughs> it's, it's such a, pride in in you know pure in 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 its pure um a stage so i recommend it to anybody who thinks that it's is strong enough and uh who is ready to uh, be a lifelong learner and to experience lots of in special moments <laughs> Sure. Oh, and, and I, I could feel the passion from all your words, and I can tell that you've just dedicated yourself and your career and, and the thoughts and everything you do to, to people, and I can feel that, and that's wonderful. And the exact words of a lifelong learner were in my mind as well, because um, with a platform that's ever-changing, uh, you, you, you will be and you'll have to be. So thank you so much. I believe we have a raised hand in our uh, platform today. Uh, Gabriella, do you want to have the floor? You have a question. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this uh, very inspiring um, opportunity and discussion with you. Um, I, uh, I have uh, actually two questions. Uh, the first is, um, how is it like to be a woman in this field, in the diplomacy field, uh, considering the fact that it's, uh, as you said, um, um, somehow a new field in which women can work? And also I know that because I was uh, um, um, following your career and I know that you were serving in the, a very difficult, I would say, places, um, and how do you, uh, have you ever felt that uh, you as a woman, even though you have the knowledge, you have everything, um, you were maybe sometimes misconsidered only because you were a woman? And um, how do you uh, face um, uh, these uh, challenges and uh, represent the country with pride? And uh, uh, I will uh, ask the second question after uh, your answer. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, this is a very long story. I'll try to, to, to make it short. Mm, well, you know, I, I love the fact that I kind of, well, it's not my merit, but I kind of wrote history, you know, in the Romanian diplomacy, not only, but of course, especially due to the fact that uh, I was the first woman ever uh, uh, to be granted the diplomatic rank, rank of ambassador, but I was also the first spoke, uh, woman spokesperson of the foreign ministry, the first woman leading the permanent mission of Romania to the United Nations. Even now, I'm the first woman in 65 years who leads the permanent delegation of Romania to UNESCO. So I love to break uh, these, uh, you know, glass ceilings. Um, I never felt discriminated, no. I have to say that, uh, um, of course, in the 90s, I was working in a predominantly male environment. And I have to say that I was in an environment of colleagues, especially the older ones, who were not used to women diplomats. Because until 1989, all they knew about women in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs were the secretaries, the executive assistants, right? But they were so kind, and I learned so much from them, you know? Uh, so, no. I could say that I was never discriminated just because I'm a woman. Maybe I was lucky. And actually, we, we girls in Romania and women in Romania, I think we are much, much luckier than our peers from other countries and continents, right? Now, we're talking now about more than 60% of female diplomats, 60% of the more than 60% of the staff, diplomatic staff, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bucharest is women. Well, that's maybe not as impressive as, as that, even if, if for us, Romanians, in 30 years, that's a good pace of, um, of uh, progress. But what is more important is that 54% of the management positions in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are women. And... Um, I think around 39% of the, the, the total number of heads of diplomatic, Romanian diplomatic missions abroad are women. So the progress is fantastic from this point of view, right? And <laughs> it was not only in diplomacy. Just recently, I just read um, the Eurobarometer uh, and also I think that the Boston Consulting Group um, um, a study about the representation of women in uh, management in business. Romania is on the top. That's amazing. Because I remember where we were in 1990. You cannot remember because you are all too young. But in 1990, there was not one woman who dared to try to be a leader because we inherited the so called. Sind Elena Ceausescu syndrome. You might not know the history of uh, Romania. The Romanian communist, uh, communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu had a wife who was an academician, being an illiterate, who had all the possible titles, scientific titles, but actually she was an illiterate. So she uh, liked to be the only woman leader in Romania. So after the revolution, women kind of were shy in, in, in getting in the leadership because they, uh, they, they ran the risk of being associated instantaneously with Elena Ceausescu. It's very hard to change a perception, historically speaking, right? But look at us now. Well, with the government, mm, we're not doing well because we have only one woman in the government, the one minister. But in, 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 in politics in general, I think that wherever you have ministers, for sure you have two deputy ministers who are women and who are doing the job, right? Uh, but in business, in business and diplomacy, I think that we are doing the best. So I'm, I'm very proud uh, of, of, this, uh, of this progress, at least in my profession. We, as a society, we have to do more, as I said, but in my profession, I'm really, really, really proud of what we achieved. Thank you so much for your answer. It's actually very uh, uh, mind opening, I would say. And also another question would be, uh, can you give us um, a, a case study, I would say, um, for um, 
a moment in history maybe when uh, cultural diplomacy was an actual instrument that changed the, maybe um, the fate between two countries or maybe in the multi, uh, multilateral level? Well, I, I wouldn't go as much historically as that. Gabriela, and I'm very, very happy to connect with you on this occasion. I know what a brilliant young lady you are. Um, and I'm glad that I met you. Um, but I will give you a, a personal example. You know, because I was uh, uh, telling you in my, in my initial um, uh, message, uh, my, my initial thoughts, that um, we all can practice cultural diplomacy. Well, I will tell you a situation. I will tell you about the situation. Uh, 2008, fresh uh, ambassador of Romania to the United Nations. As I said, first woman ever. But austerity comes because the financial crisis hit Romania very hard. Well, we had a budget almost zero, right? In New York, where you know, the capital of the world in promotion, advertising, and whatever, whatchamacallit, um, people invest a lot of money in the image of their countries or in the image of their companies or in their image, right? And I had none. And I remember that we had uh, to lobby uh, for uh, Romania because we were the candidate for the Human Rights Council. But we had no money for anything while Georgia, who was not in austerity, invested a lot of money in campaigning and uh, you know, welcoming uh, all the ambassadors from New York, uh, uh, taking them to visit the, the beautiful Georgia. So that was a pretty you know, uh, unbalanced competition. And uh, to say, tell the story short, because of course it's a long and uh, uh, beautiful story for me and very complex, um, I used my little singing talent and I became, um, you know, a kind of a music star in the, in the ambassadorial circle because I managed to do a few projects, but this along the years. Um, uh, for instance, I gathered five ambassadors from five different, different countries. We recorded and produced and, uh, uh, you know, released an album called Ambassadors Sing for Peace, where we were singing covers, peace covers in French, English, and Spanish. And then I founded the first ever uh, ambassadorial pop rock band called UN Rocks. And we released a CD uh, called Strong UN Better World. And we sang in you know, the UN General Assembly, in uh, Lincoln Center. I mean, you know, for my country, my personal success that I, of course I, I put at its service was a blessing because, you know, in that circle, huge 193 member states, I was the face of Romania. I was not Simona, I was Romania in their perception, right? So whatever I was doing was serving or not my country. It's not my personal victory. Everything that I do as an ambassador is devoted to the success and the victory of my country. So Romania was very loved. Of course, and this is also a point that I connect with your first question. Um, people can be nice with you because, for instance, when I was ambassador in New, in New York, at the beginning, we were only 17 women ambassadors out of 193, right? So we were in a predominant uh, male uh, environment, right? So I never got more compliments than in, during those years. But as, that's not enough, my dear. Your talent, your charm, uh, the fact that you are, I don't know, a woman that is charming, maybe, it's not enough. Professionalism is what counts. And I always said, that professionalism, for me, is a unisex term. Uh, people can like you, people can chat with you, but once you prove that you are also a good professional, then they begin to take you in consideration for 
the serious stuff, right? So um, that was a, an exercise, a personal exercise of cultural diplomacy that I think served my country, served its perception. And that is why whenever I have the chance, I tell my younger uh, friends that they have to use whatever little talent they have and they really can help their professional development. So don't hesitate. You are talented in painting or in calligraphy or music or whatever talent you have. Find a way to use it to complement your professional endeavors. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring. Thank you. I, I ask permission to, to have uh, 10 seconds of something. If may I, Mrs. Ambassador? I want sure. to share something, wait. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I promise just two seconds. Oh, that's a rehearsal. That's a rehearsal, yeah. and actually, that's a Danish ambassador to 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 the UN who was an excellent bass player and vocalist. But that's only a rehearsal. I can send you after that. Maybe I will send you uh, the the video that I produced with twenty five ambassadors last year, which was a cover to Heal the World and uh, was uh, actually a tribute to the frontline people. Yeah, I, I see that uh, Cornelio, Cornelio Kishu maybe don't believe you when you say you sing. So just I share a few seconds. I challenge him to take a look on the YouTube to see more. Okay. No, and no, I will send him. I will send him a, a link better. <laughs> okay. Cornelio, as I see, you want to ask, right? You have to yes. put a question. I want to ask a, a question. <clears throat> First of all, uh, you know, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Madam Ambassador for uh, the achievement of her career and what she's doing further. But I would like to emphasize that uh, it's very important that our background and our uh, years of uh, education that we have had in the same city, you made the first woman ambassador in Romania, I made the first Romanian ed uh, elected in the Canadian parliament. So, but this is done by our own background raising up with a strong culture, even though that we were living in a communist regime. Now, my question to you, how we are dealing today with the so-called cancel culture? In Canada now, they are starting to rewrite history. They are starting to, to take out the status of the founders of the country, like Sir John and McDonald. And this is a movement, you know, telling that you know, these guys, they have done nothing. They were colonials and so on. I think that the same phenomenon is going on in the United States. So how we are dealing with this so-called rewriting of the history, uh, blaming uh, some people for, uh, you know, uh, emphasizing the negatives and not only the, the things that they have done. So the first, uh, I'm thinking of the Sir John McDonald. The, the, the person who established, who made Canada to be a nation. So now there are a, a lot of movements. Oh, you were colonials, you were this, you are taking out your status because you, you don't need to, your name, uh, you, you, you are not by our standards today. So how you can deal with these issues? I think that in Romania we have going on the reverse. We are reestablishing all the personalities uh, during the history and so on. But now in Canada and in the Western world, it is a movement against culture. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I had, uh, thank God, uh, several occasions to express my profound respect for your achievements. I mean, hey, you made it amazingly in a foreign country that became your home, of course, but um, I think it was a much more difficult journey 
and I respect that very much and I'm so proud of you. And thank you for representing not only you know, uh, Canada, but also representing a part of you which is Romanian and especially a part of you that was, uh, was formed uh, in, in, in Satu Mare, uh, our common uh, hometown. Um, and I will never have enough of saying how crucial, crucial, the first, not only the first seven years, I think that the first uh, 18 years of your life are in making you who you are. I, as, I, as I'm aging, I, I become ever more aware of how amazingly important my education in Satumare was. And that's why I kind of, I kind of go back with ever more love and I, I really think that I will retire there, I tell you, because the roots as, as, as you age and, or as you go ever farther from your home, the roots in you begin to vibrate ever more. And I know, I know that you know that feeling. As far as the radicalization and the, the political correctness is concerned, because I couldn't, I couldn't say, I think that we would go too far to say that uh, we are countering culture. Um, unfortunately, you, are, uh, you have this bad luck because actually this is kind of a phenomenon that is predominant in North America. And uh, um, it, 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 it's much too complex and much too sensitive to talk about it, but um, it's not only about um, the, the, the current circumstances uh, which were aggravated by the, by, by the pandemic. But I think it's also a phenomenon that belongs to countries who don't have such a long history as ours. It's hundreds of years of history, it's not thousands of years of history. Maybe in these kind of countries, you know, the dynamics are different uh, and the perception of history is different as in our countries. Thank God in Romania, we don't have this problem. Um, and I'm really glad that uh, 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 we didn't have uh, uh, very many or at all extremist and uh, 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 fundamentalist uh, tendencies in politics. Now there are some worries about certain parties, but um, let's, uh, let's, let's hope that we won't, uh, we won't go there. I think that uh, there is no easy answer to this question because it depends so much uh, of, the, of, the, of the national context. So we can discuss about the topic when we are uh, uh, referring to the United States and then to Canada, who we all know is much more softer in approaches in general, in whatever pertains to life. Everybody says that Canadians are nice <laughs> and they deserve this perception, right? And this comes with an entire uh, context. Um, but I think that we can help our kids by uh, encouraging them to know, to learn about their history and about their culture and about their identity. And then if they are solidly prepared, they will be able to discern all sorts of tendencies and if necessary, to combat them. But I truly believe that history is a must uh, for the, 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 the training, the formation of absolutely any, any kid these days. You have to know your own history, your own culture, your own identity in order to be able to preserve it and protect it when necessary. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions out there? I know we have a bunch of people watching us on um, Facebook who might not have a question, but hopefully if they do, they can connect with us and get that to you. Um, wonderful. Any other questions from anybody that are that's uh, joining us via Zoom?
Okay. So, well, sorry, sorry. No, there we go. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, so, uh, bună ziua, um, good afternoon, e bonjour. Uh, it's bonjour. such an honor. I just have uh, one curiosity, if I may, and if you can share it with us. So, which is, um, as I said, just curiosity, um, which was your dearest stay during a mission? I mean, in which country and why? Uh, is it work-related? I mean, um, does it have to do with your work only or is it for personal reasons? I don't know. I mean, mm, did you uh, like the I people did... better in one country? Mm. My dearest day, you said? A stay, your dearest stay. Oh, no, 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 that's not fair. That's not fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is, why I was, this is why I, I was mentioning, actually, if you sure. can share it with us. <laughs> sure, no problem, of course. But it's, it's, you know, it's so difficult to make a classification because it's always, you know, every, you will see in life, every chapter of your life, if it's better or worse, you don't know, but it's special. Uh, you cannot make comparisons. So, of course, you will think that I will say, oh my gosh, the, the most fantastic stay in my life was in New York. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I lived like seven amazing years. Well, I'm not sure about that because I remember the, the years spent in Baghdad under the bombs. And I have to say that my experience in Baghdad was transformational. It made me look at life differently. I grew a bond with my Iraqi colleagues that go for for the entire life. I could say, uh, say the same about my experience in Kosovo. How can I say that the, the, I didn't cherish the experience in Kosovo, but I loved my first diplomatic experience in Washington DC that taught me immense things. So it's, it's, it's impossible to tell you a favorite stay because each stay represented a chapter in my life and career, and it had amazing moments. And it had also difficulties. It had also moments in which I cried, moments in which I was frightened. But all this is part of life. And I think that you have to cherish every moment that you, that you live. I really think that now more than ever, the, the Latin um, a slogan, carpe diem, seize the moment, is more timely than ever before. So I encourage you, to cherish every, every minute of your life and learn, especially from the mistakes and the failures, because they are very important in your personal development. That's fantastic. Many, many things. And have a great day ahead. Good to mask. <laughs> so, other? No other curiosities? Hmm. Come on. We just have a few minutes with Mrs. Ambassador. I, I want to challenge you to say something about. Uh, we are surround. We, we are now are living in, uh, let's say, um, in the area where our neighbors, um, our neighbor, big neighbor, Russia, uh, of course, have some uh, attitudes, um, geopolitical attitudes. Let's say like this. As you as you know. Um, uh, I, uh, my job is, and I'm working in the nuclear security, and I do a lot of work with the International Atomic Energy Agency, where I work with a lot of Russian colleagues. So, um, economically, and also diplomatically in the last days, you can see a lot of, uh, um, again, uh, um, no, no discussion measures taken by um, uh, states as the United States or EU countries against the diplomats in Russia. Uh, and Russia, vice versa, against the Western countries. So, as I told you, so economically, in one hand, with the sanctions, and on the other hand, the diplomatic sanctions uh, with, uh, with the Russia. But we have uh, two areas. One, uh, nuclear area, when I mentioned to you, and now I, I want to move to your side, to, to your uh, uh, activities there. How is this, like, how is this um, um, activity with uh, Russian colleagues? It means UNESCO is different than other um, economical or uh, diplomatical areas uh, in relation with the Russia Federation as a state who create, who challenge the Western world? 
Uh, yes. Uh, what I want to say well, that, Mrs. Ambassador, you say that at the beginning, culture win in all we do. It means we can use culture to make the world be better. No, what I wanted to tell you is the following thing. Um, there is a difference between uh, bilateral diplomacy and multilateral diplomacy, right? In bilateral diplomacy, we have our bilateral interests. Unfortunately, our relationship with Russia is not, um, uh, is a pretty um, complex one, let's say. But in the multilateral diplomacy, I think for me as a diplomat, it is easier. Because uh, I, uh, um, it is a smoother journey, let's say. Um, we have common interests as far as the culture of the world is concerned, the education, the science of the world is concerned. So I really think that is, it's a much, much, much smoother relationship than the one that you have bilaterally. So we, we try to cope all the time with these nuances. And I have to tell you, beyond diplomats, even diplomats are human beings. I have to tell you, in, in the UN, one of my best friends in the UN environment was the Russian ambassador. Man, what an incredible professional and human being. I think it's not by, by chance that he actually died in his office in New York. He was so passionate, so devoted. So I would like to make this difference between human beings and professionals, between trying to uh, approach wisely uh, a relationship from the point of view of a specific interest. Thank you. I, I see life as, a, as a, a big house with a lot of windows. Unfortunately, some windows need to be keep it closed or not so open and other doors, mm -hmm. other windows need to be open, especially to continue to live together in the same home. Absolutely, I agree. Nice metaphor. Uh, by the way, I have a guest who is coming. Um, the, he just rang the bell. Um, I, I have to say goodbye because I knew that um, uh, we are finishing at 2.45. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I got to go. No, we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I thank you. Thank it's you. Such a chance. Let's do it again. Thank have you. a wonderful day and life. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Talk. Goodbye.